Wakanda was a mythical place that most black people fell in love with during the Black Panther experience because of what it symbolized. Black excellence, black intelligence, black wealth, black determination, black power. But Wakanda didn't exist. However, there was a mighty African empire that did exist that arguably was the true Wakanda. You probably never heard of it. It's called Aksum, A-K-S-U-M. Sometimes it's spelled A-X-U-M. It existed in what is Northeastern Africa, covered the territory of modern day Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, and Yemen came into existence 100 BCE, although some people say its founding was 350 BCE. This great empire lasted a minimum of 1,000 years. What made Aksum great? Well, a couple of things. First of all, Aksum defeated Kush somewhere around 350 AD. Aksum was also great because it was situated on the Red Sea and from its port city of Agilis, it controlled the maritime trade routes, ships entering and exiting the Red Sea on their way to the Indian Ocean to trade with China and India and points beyond. So Aksum charged a toll or a tax to go in and out of uh, the Red Sea. Aksum traded in silk and other fine linen and gold and silver and pottery. It was a place of commerce. But what made Aksum also great was that it had a mighty navy and a mighty army. And Aksum was recognized in its day as one of the four major world powers. There was China, there was Persia, there was Rome, and there was Aksum. It's amazing that you probably never heard of it. Let me tell you a few more things about Aksum. Aksum, the people of Aksum spoke three different languages. They spoke the languages, they read them, and they wrote them. They spoke Greek because Greek was the language of commerce. They spoke Sabaean because that enabled them to um, communicate with their Arabic neighbors for trading purposes. And they spoke Giz, which was their native language. King Azana was the most significant uh, person in the history of the nation or the empire of Aksa. He converted to Christianity in around the year 333 AD. At that time, uh, Aksum minted gold coins that was part of their national currency and they had the image of the disc and the crescent which was a symbol of their religion. But when Izana converted to Christianity, he changed the image on the national coins to the image of the cross. He was all in. Historians, Western historians, have attributed Constantine of Rome to being the first emperor to convert to Christianity, but those who have studied this situation closely give this credit to King Izana. He was, in many respects, the true T'Challa. Not mythic, actual, real, committed to his nation and committed to his God committed to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He was a real person, and his nation, Oxen, was perhaps, as I said at the outset, the most significant African empire that ever existed. Oxen was arguably the real Wakanda. Egypt was an empire that existed for 3,000 years, 3,000. So it didn't get as far as China, but it was as old as China, but it just didn't last as long as China. But uh, even a, a civilization that lasted for 3,000 years is worth studying. What did they do right? What did they do wrong? Well, they, what they did wrong is that there were tension within, their, within the nation. There's tension between uh, tribes or, or local dominions. There was tension constantly between the, the priests and the, and the Pharaoh, that was just a constant thing. And when one was weak, the other was strong. Egypt existed for 3,000 years, but they had 
three periods, which, which um, historians refer to as the intermediate periods. And that's just a nice way of saying that the central government broke down completely. Imagine that there's no government at all in Washington, D.C. for 200 years this went on in Egypt. Can you imagine that? For 200 years, there, there were times during these intermediate periods where there was not one central government, but, but there was maybe 10 or 15 different regional governments and they competed with each other until some strong man came back and rose up and, and reunited the kingdom and then it went on and that was what was called another dynasty. But Egypt had a total of 30 dynasties. The 25th dynasty, which is not celebrated, was founded by black Africans from Kush, which is modern day Sudan. But remember, Sudan, the word Sudan is an Arabic term, which means the black land. There are black people in every sense of the term. If you look at their images, Taharqa, which is mentioned in the Bible, coming to the assistance of Hezekiah when the Assyrians were coming to seize Jerusalem and Judah. It's in Isaiah, I believe, chapter 38, and it's in Hezekiah either not Hezekiah, but 1 Kings or 2 Kings. You have to figure that out. Chapter 19, look, you'll see the man. It says he's an Ethiopian, but as I've shared with you before, whenever the Bible refers to Ethiopians, it's generally referring to Africans, people of dark skin, black skin from the continent of Africa. But generally the term Ethiopian is used. It says that Taharqa was the king of the Ethiopians. We know that he actually was one of the kings, one of the pharaohs of the 25th dynasties. It's amazing, but how the 25th dynasty came into existence is that, is that Egypt was going through one of those intermediate periods where the central government was falling apart. And why I shared this with you is because it seems to me, it seems to me as a student of history that we look like we're headed toward a intermediate period right here in the United States. Taharqa and, 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 and the, the Kushites were known for their military prowess. Uh, nations from around the world, and that includes Persia, and that includes Assyria, and that even includes Egypt, hired them as experts. They were actually the secret service for the pharaohs, these black men. They had a, a special skill uh, of being able to shoot a opponent's eye out from like 300 yards away with a bow and arrow. So they would be the equivalent of sharpshooters today. Kush, before it was called Kush, it was called Taseti, which by interpretation means the land of the bow, because they were tough. They were awesome. They were powerful brothers, literally in every sense of the term that we use that. But that's not how they conquered Egypt. How they conquered Egypt, how they established the 25th dynasty was two things. I told you one. The central government was falling apart. The people were at odds with each other politically. They couldn't get on the same sheet of music because I told you at the beginning of this lecture that political ideology is the weakest form of glue. There he is, politically, historically. And blood is the number one. Then religion is the second. So what Alara, A-L-A-R-A, -A -A, Alara, who was the founder of the 25th dynasty, what he discovered, what he understood was when the political system is teetering on the verge of collapse, it is an opportunity that's presented for the religious people, the moral people, the people who have moral authority to stand up and say, this is the way, follow it. Let's talk about the most significant African empire of all times. I'm talking about Kush. What made Kush a great empire is that it fought and at times conquered and ruled uh, the most significant empire in the world at that time, which was Egypt. Kush was known by its neighbors and its enemies as Taseti, which means the land of the bow. Powerful military brothers who were feared and revered and actually recruited by other empires uh, during its existence. But what also made Kush significant, powerful, uh, worthy of your study and worthy of your admiration and mine, is that it had this amazing ability to reinvent itself. Kush's first capital city was Karma. That city existed for roughly a thousand years and then it fell due to the invasion of the people of Kemet or Egypt as we know them. Then they moved their border down uh, south a little bit to get away from Egypt to a place called Napata and they reinvented themselves. And in that area, 
when Napata was its capital, it rose up in around 744, 747 BCE, and began to rule Egypt at that time, which was in a, a period of what, what, what the social scientists refer to as the intermediate period, which is a nice way of saying Egypt had fallen apart. The central government was non-existent. There were several uh, different smaller fiefdoms, and Kush rose up. After 500 years of being oppressed, after 500 years of being colonized, and ruled its colonizers. It's unprecedented in history. But there was this back and forth. At some point, a Near Eastern super empire that was referred to as Assyria came in and invaded Egypt, drove the Kushite kings out, who were a part of what is called the 25th dynasty, drove them out, and that would have been in many instances, the end of the empire, but in the case of Kush, it was not. And this is the thing that was impressive and is impressive about the Kushite empire because it kept reinventing itself. From Kerma, it went to Napata. From Napata, it reestablished itself in a place called Meroe. And once it reestablished itself in Meroe, it existed for an additional, roughly an additional 1,000 years. Kush was known by its enemies as Taseti, which means the land of the bow. And that was a reference to the fact that the Kushite archers were known for being very skillful. They could put a bow and arrow right in the center of a person's eyeball from 300 yards away. They were sharpshooters. Today they would be snipers. They were feared and revered and loathed at the same time by the Egyptians they were recruited by the Egyptians to be essentially secret service for the, for the pharaohs. They were recruited by the Greeks to serve as mercenaries. They were recruited by the Persians to serve as mercenaries. They were recruited by the Assyrians. These brothers were bad to the bone. Taseti, the land of the bow. But they were deeply religious people. How they rose up after 500 years of being oppressed by Egypt is not by the bow. They were powerful and they were formidable, but they were deeply and profoundly religious. And Kemet and Cush shared the same belief in a god that was referred to as Amun-Ra. And in the intermediate period in Egypt that began somewhere around 1025 BCE, the priest in Egypt had become corrupt. And the central government had become ineffective. And because the Kushite kings from the 25th dynasty, beginning with a person by the name of Kashta, and going on to another king named Pianke, and perhaps the most uh, celebrated and widely known Kushite king that was a part of this 25th dynasty was a person by the name, of, a king by the name of Taharka, which Taharka is actually mentioned in the Hebrew Bible because he came to the aid of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, when Assyria was trying to overthrow it. Cush is mentioned in the Bible both in terms of uh, Moses' wife, uh, was a Cushite woman in the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, uh, if you're reading the King James Version, it says that he was married to an Ethiopian. But whenever the Hebrew Bible or the King James uses the term Ethiopian, it is a reference to anyone who's from Africa, particularly anyone who's of dark skin. So Cush is mentioned in the Bible in terms of Moses, the great deliverer and the great prophet of the Hebrew people, being married to a Cushite woman. So think about that. All of the lineage of Moses, which was quite substantial over time, were half black. But the first time that this name Cush is mentioned in the Bibles, uh, in the 10th chapter of the book of Genesis, Cush is the grandson of Noah and the son of Ham. The name literally means black. Now, why is that important? Because I've done videos in the past where we were talking about Oxum, which I believe was, a, and it, I know for sure, it was a mighty African empire. But there was some dispute among the people as, uh, that actually uh, watched the video whether or not it was a black empire. When it comes to Cush, there is no doubt, 100%, 
It was a black and an African empire. It's a symbol of strength. It is a symbol of resilience. It is, in my thinking, especially when we talk about what happened in 9000 BCE in the place called Nabda Playa, the astrological studies, the accurate measurements of the stars that were going on 9000 BCE among these black people, it is a symbol of the beginning of civilization itself. It is the most impressive empire that has ever existed in my thinking, and I'm not excluding Egypt in the total assessment. It, in my thinking, predates and outshines Egypt and probably was a parent civilization to Egypt. And we can talk about that more. There's so much that I can say about Kush, but I invite you to study this great empire, Kush. Kush was an amazing empire because two words, it adjusted and it adapted. And this is best seen through the fact that over the 2,700 years that it existed, it had three separate capitals. The capitals changed from time to time because Kush was making adjustments. And I think that's a lesson for us in the world today, particularly black people living in America and other places around the world. Sometimes you have to move. Sometimes you have to adjust to the circumstances. Even though you don't like what they are, you adjust, you adapt, you survive, you continue on. The first capital of Kush was Karma. Karma came into existence somewhere around 2700 uh, BC. It lasted for roughly 1200 years. There's some discussion and debate about how long it lasted, but we know that it came to an end when the Egyptians came down and damaged it, destroyed it because of the fact that, they, that the Kushites had partnered with the, Hiss, the Hyksos, which is the Semitic people from Palestine who came in and dominated and ruled Egypt for a certain period of time. So, Egypt wanted to make sure that Kush would not support its enemies in the future, so Karma fell. But before it fell, it was known for uh, smelting iron. It was known for pottery, very distinct pottery that um, it, you can see in, in different museums around the world today, gorgeous pottery uh, that when you see it, you know it, it comes from Kush. It was known also, Karma was centered in a location where it was uh, at a strategic location in terms of this, the trade routes between Egypt and uh, inner Africa uh, and trades that went from the Horn of Africa to the Red Sea. So that's one of the things that made Karma very wealthy and very powerful early on. But after the Egyptian um, attack, roughly around 1500 uh, BC, then the people of Kush moved their capital southward to Napata or Napata, and it was there that uh, it relaunched itself and continued to exist. Now, what we should know from past uh, posts about Napata, that is the place where Alara, Kashta, and Pianke uh, formed and uh, executed its wonderful plan to rise up and rule over Egypt. Uh, this occurrence is referred to, or in, in, in Egyptian history, uh, the rule of the Nubians is referred to as the, the 25th dynasty. So not only did uh, the Kushites adapt and adjust for the circumstances, but they regrouped and they came back and, and they launched their plan from their second capital, which is Napata. But again, uh, there were further conflicts and wars and attacks from Egypt because there were times when Egypt was weak and when e Egypt was weak, Kush was strong and vice versa. And during one of those periods where uh, Egypt was coming out of what is referred to by Egyptologists as one of their intermediate periods, it came to Napata, the second capital of Kush, and burned it to the ground, destroyed it. Now, what Napata was also known for before that is where the royals were buried, where the kings were buried, and there's still some graves that they discovered in and around uh, Napata, uh, Kushite uh, kings, queens, and other uh, people of, of importance and significance were buried there. But what did the Kushites do true to form? They adapted and they adjusted, and again, that's a message to us today, 
in the midst of chaotic and unfavorable political and economic circumstances, we can whine, we can complain, or we can adjust. When we talk about our ancestors and, and venerating them and honoring them, one way that we can venerate and honor our ancestors is by doing what they did, adapting and adjusting. Now, the last capital of Kush, Meroe. Meroe is known for the fact that the, the Kushites perfected the smelting of iron. With that, they uh, created uh, very complex and very effective uh, weapons of war. They uh, refined their farming tools. Uh, so again, at every stage when they could have simply thrown their hands up in the air and said, we give, we give up, we tried multiple times, it didn't work out, they continued to reinvent themselves and they continued to get better and to perfect their craft and their technology. One of the things that they also did uh, was develop a written language referred to as the Meroitic script. Often when you hear about Africa, when you think about Africa, how it's been portrayed historically on National Geographic and other historical sites, it's a bunch of black people running through the jungle in skirts and, and bones through their nose and, and exotic earrings. And I'm not trying to play, uh, speak to that because that's part of culture. And I think it means something and it has worth and value. But uh, these people in Merrill way had their own written language. Egyptologists and other nubiologists have been able to decode it, but they don't fully understand it. So the culture and the civilization of Kush continue to evolve. That's the point. Uh, smelting iron uh, has often been referred to as the Birmingham of, of East Africa, because if you know something about Birmingham in the United States of America, you know that that is where uh, a lot of iron ore is extracted from the ground in the United States, but before that, thousands of years before they found iron ore in the United States, uh, the, the Africans were extracting it at Meroe. So at Meroe, you had Meroitic script developed, you had iron ore, and you had the building of pyramids. Do you know that there were more pyramids built in Kush than in Egypt? Kush has at least 200 pyramids. They're smaller, steeper slope, but nevertheless, they are there. So much to know, so much to learn about Kush. Hopefully, I'm whetting your appetite and I'm inviting you to do some independent study. We'll continue to talk about Kush. I'll see you next time. The name Kush first appears in the Bible, Genesis chapter 10. Cush is one of the grandsons of Noah. He's the son of Ham. Cush is the father of Nimrod. The Bible says that Nimrod was the first empire builder. Some of the cities that he built, Shinar, Babel, the empire, Babylon, perhaps even the founder of Assyria. So this guy, Nimrod, is the son of Cush. The name Cush means black, straightforwardly. Of all the ancient Eastern African empires that I've studied, that I believe is worth studying, that I could recommend to you, the viewer today, in terms of what's worth studying, I would highly recommend that you study Kemet, which is modern-day Egypt, that you also study Aksum, which is modern-day Ethiopia. But for my money, and for the depth of knowledge and information that comes to us, that we are still benefiting from in Western civilization today, I say uh, Kush is, is that empire that, that I find the most interesting. For many reasons, some that relate to religion, others that relate to science, astronomy, still others that, that relate to uh, the military prowess of these men, these archers, these warriors that were world renowned. So Cush is the name, and the first time we see the name, 
It spells C-U-H. It's in the Bible. But we are fairly confident that the empire that is named Kush, which is K-U-S-H, is the one and the same. I mean, if you just do the work in terms of looking at the region in which Kush in the Bible resided and his descendants resided, and you overlay that with the Kush of, the Bi of, of secular history, then you can see very clearly it's the same entity. Kush, as it is spelled uh, modern day in secular terms, K-U-S-H, was first uh, used by the people of Egypt or Kemet in referring to the empire that was on their southwest border that they had dealings with in terms of trade, in terms of intermarrying, but also in terms of confrontation. So over a period of thousands and thousands of years, Kemet had these interactions. Some were friendly, some were just basically business transactions, and some were downright hostile. There were times at which Kush invaded uh, Kemet. There were times at which Kemet invaded Kush. But in terms of the name, that was the first time that we see it spelled K-U-S-H, and that is actually in the records of, of the people of Kemet. They're referring to it as one of their neighbors, at times one of their opponents, at, at times one of their trading partners. But another name that was very popular, very wide, widely known for Kush was Ta Seti. Ta Seti. Now, Ta Seti means the land of the bow. The word Ta means land, Seti, bow. And they refer to the people of Kush as being the land of the bow because they were particularly known for their skill, their talent, and their ability with the bow. They were actually known for their military prowess all the way around. They had armies at times where they fought with elephants that they used as essentially tanks. They were fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat warriors, but they were especially known around the world and actually recruited by major empires including uh, Kemet, at times their arch enemy, to be mercenaries. It's interesting about Kush in terms of the, these uh, warriors, the police that watched over them essentially be the secret service for the pharaohs, many of them came from Tuseti. That speaks to the level of military skill, strength, ability, achievement that, that the people of Kush had. Kush was, uh, as uh, I've said before in other lectures, recruited not just by uh, Egypt or Kemet, but by other empires such as Assyria, uh, perhaps even Persia, and other places. We know that they were known for being fierce. We've talked about the fact that the Romans found out the hard way that they were not something to be toyed with. When, when Rome was conquering the world and essentially facing no resistance wherever they went, they ran into very staunch uh, resistance. The fact is that Cush lost battles against Rome, but more amazingly, no one expected this little tiny African empire to win anything against the mighty Roman Empire, but they won battles. Not just one battle. They won battles, in fact, in terms of the, the exchange of slaves, when we think about slavery, for example, we think about the Europeans coming into Africa and taking African people and making them slaves. One of the interesting things about Cush is that when Cush went to battle with Rome, at points, they captured Roman soldiers, white European Roman soldiers, and enslaved them and brought them back to Kush. That's certainly not something that is widely t uh, discussed in, in Western history because it, it belies the, the, the false notion 
in terms of why the West said they had to come into Africa and subjugate the people who had not declared war on them, had not tried to take their goods, their talents, and their lands. So the false narrative was that we had to educate these people, we had to enlighten them. Therefore, God called us to enslave them. Well, if you understand that actually Cush enslaved Romans, that kind of flips the script entirely, right? But if we even go back further into uh, ancient history, we talk about the fact that the Greeks around the 500s and 400 BC era traveled to Kemet, traveled as far as Cush to learn the sciences, to learn philosophy. And when the people of Cush and Kemet talked about philosophy, it wasn't just the esoteric abstract thought about the meaning of life. For them, uh, philosophy was medicine, it was geometry, it was mathematics, it was the hard sciences included in that and mostly taught by the priests. The thing about Cush and Kemet that, that, that caused them have, to have a love-hate relationship is they had the same god, uh, uh, Amun-Ra was the name. They had the same god. His name was Amun-Ra. And the priests of Amun-Ra, or Ra for short, were the keepers of the secrets of society. And that related to not just religious uh, philosophy and, and theology, but also science itself, medicine, astronomy, uh, the things that we take for granted today. The, the, the developments of civilization that have been wrongly attributed to, um, to Greece. If you look at the, the Greeks' early writings relative to their interaction with Cush and Kemet, which I talk about them interchangeably somewhat at this point, and I know that I'm doing that, but I'm doing that with intentionality because actually there, is, there are many scholars who believe that Kemet, or Egypt, was a colony of Cush. In other words, uh, if you know something about Northeast Africa, you know that the Nile River flows from south uh, to north. And that as society was being developed, the people migrated from the south to the north. So we know geographically that Cush is south of, of Egypt, or Kemet. And, and there are writings that suggest, ancient writings that suggest that the people of Kemet were actually the descendants or colony of Cush. Now, of course, if you look at the writings that some of the, that the Egyptians had, they, they spoke about Cush in condescending, disparaging terms. They referred to Cush as being vile Cush. But you have to wonder whether or not that's language that's jaded by the fact that they were jealous at times, that they were competitors at times. That the name of the game during that time was becoming wealthy and becoming powerful by controlling the trade routes. And the fact is, at times, Kemet controlled the trade routes, and at other times, Cush controlled the trade routes. So Cush is this interesting place uh, where 9,000 years ago, and I want to make sure I'm correcting myself in terms of the math, but I believe it is, 9,000 years ago in a place uh, that is today modern-day uh, southwest Egypt, but then it was a part of Nubia, then a part of Cush. Today we have these fixed boundaries, but 4,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, the, internet, the international boundaries were not so fixed. And in fact, they were fluid. But the Nubians, 9,000 years ago, in a place called Nabda Playa, the Kushites were studying the distance between the planets, the speed at which the planets were traveling, the speed at which planet Earth was uh, rotating or uh, moving through space. They had some sense of that. In a place called Nabda Playa, they created the first 365-day uh, calendar. Uh, which we still use today, but they're not credited with that. So when I talk about the Eastern uh, Empires, and we're going to talk some more as we go into this 
uh, in, in future postings. But when we talk about these three very significant uh, Eastern African am empires that, that existed a long time ago, uh, we're talking about Kemet, we're, we're talking about 5,000 years ago, Kush, roughly the same, Aksum, um, existed beginning in 100 BC and going on to 800, 900 AD, a thousand years roughly. So we're talking about these very significant uh, East African empires that interacted with each other, arguably were related to each other. If we're now going to the biblical model, we know for sure that Cush's brother, younger brother, was Misra. And if you know something in terms of uh, Arabic, language that today Egypt is referred to by Arabic people not as Egypt but as Mizra because that's consistent with the Bible. Ham had several sons, one was Cush and another was Mizra. So if we take that on its face value, we know that the people of Cush and the people of Mizra or Kemet were related, they were brothers. And we also can reasonably deduce that the people of Oxen are related. But today we're focusing on Cush, and we'll talk more about Cush. Today we're going to discuss the mighty empire of Mali. Mali existed from 1230 AD to 1670 AD. Now I know that there is a country in West Africa that is currently named Mali, but we're not talking about the same thing. The empire of Mali actually at its apex encompass modern day Mali, but also Senegal and Gambia and Guinea and Niger and Nigeria, Chad, Mauritania and Burkina Faso. So, it was much more expansive than the current country of Mali, but it was an empire. This empire found its origins in the fact that it was strategically located on the Niger River, a point at which travelers who were traders met to cool off. And also it was a crossroad for different trading routes. So again, historically, when we look at what are some of the mightiest empires, and we've talked about, for example, uh, Kemet, and we've talked about Kush, what's strategic is location near a river, uh, because a river can provide many things, right? Drinking water, water to grow crops, uh, transportation. And so Niger is that river in Northwest Africa, and this particular mighty empire was founded around that great river. Mali was known for three products that it traded with other nations for their goods and services. Elephant tusk, gold. In fact, Mali had a lot of gold. And we'll talk about in just a moment one particular king or one particular emperor who had so much gold, he didn't know what to do with it. But the third product that, that Mali was known for was salt. You see in, in hot, arid uh, environments where people sweat a lot, salt is, is critical to assist the body in preserving its water content. Do you know that at some point, Mali traded in salt and the value of salt, pound for pound, was equal to the value of gold. And sometimes it was even more valuable. The different rulers of Mali were referred to as Mansas. That was the title. Mansa was like saying king or emperor. The most widely known Mansa was an emperor by the name of Mansa Musa. Now he's known by the Europeans. He's known by uh, the Arab world. Uh, Mansa Musa started his life as a son of a king. And at his birth, he was not uh, a practicing uh, uh, Muslim, but at some point he converted to Islam. 
And in keeping with uh, the tradition of all good uh, Muslims, he made a Hajj or a journey to Mecca. Now, he was so rich. You may say, how rich was he? Well, he was so rich that his entourage included 60,000 people, over 1,000 camels, and they were all loaded with gold. He had so much gold, he didn't know what to do with it. He handed it out in every town he went to. When he arrived at Egypt, he handed out so much gold in Egypt that it totally crashed their economy, and it took Egypt 12 years after Mansa Musa visited there to recover because he just put so much money into to the economy that it inflated the value of everything because there was so much gold. You got a piece of bread, uh, 12,000 pounds of gold. You got some chicken, 10,000 pounds of gold. I mean, I'm just exaggerating, but there was so much gold there. As I said, salt was more valuable at times than gold. But he was a generous man. He expanded, and I say he meaning Mansa Musa, the most celebrated uh, emperor or king of, of the empire of Mali. He doubled the size of, of the Mali empire during the time that, that he reigned. Now, Mali is known for a few other things. It's known for two famous cities. Gao. Gao was the administrative center of Mali. It was the place where all of the government was set up and, and the div different divisions uh, of, of the empire were coordinated through the city of Gao. Gao is spelled G-A-O. And Gao was actually discovered fairly recently in terms of history. And the walls of Gao are still in existence today. And they weren't uh, wooden walls. They were actually mud brick walls. It was a well laid out planned city. You, if you have the time and the money, you might want to take that trip. It's, it would be quite the trip, but Gao still exists. The other center or the other city that was um, significant in the Mali Empire was Timbuktu. Now, I'm sure you may have heard this name before, and Timbuktu is a byword for some place in the middle of nowhere, but actually Timbuktu actually existed. Whereas Gao was the administrative center for the, the Empire of Mali, Timbuktu was the religious and the intellectual uh, center for the Empire of Mali. Uh, the first university that was built on the continent of Africa was built in Timbuktu. The library in Timbuktu was reported to have between 250,000 and 800,000 books. And that's important because when we think about Africa, again, the images that we've received throughout time through, regarding how Africans have been portrayed by Europeans as backward, unlearned, savages. But no, actually, they had a university in the middle of the desert. We're talking about between 1230 AD and 1460 or 1470 AD. They had a library with 800,000 books if not the largest mosque at the time that were built in Africa, were built in Timbuktu. What Mansa Musa did is he built administrative buildings, he built religious buildings, he built buildings that just had different um, architectural designs. He brought in the best and the brightest minds from all around the Islamic world. They met, it was a place of learning, it was a cultural hub and I'm sure if you've heard about it, you thought it was some distant, remote place. Most people think that it was some made-up place, but it actually existed. And it existed because of the dreams and the vision that Mansa Musa had. Now, of course, he wasn't the only Mansa, but he is the most celebrated Mansa. In fact, there was a map that was done by the Europeans, uh, particularly, I think it was a Spanish map drawer, and it actually shows Mansa Musa sitting in some place holding a nugget of gold. And that was symbolic of how wealthy he was and how wealthy his empire was. Now, some people say that Mansa Musa's wealth, if we, if we measured it in today's dollars and cents, would be roughly, his net worth would be roughly $400 billion. Can you imagine that? The wealthiest man on planet Earth during that time was not someone in Asia, 
not someone in Europe, and they had a lot of wealth that they stole from Africa and Asia and other places in Europe, but the wealthiest man on planet Earth was right there in Mali, and he was worth $400 billion. That is significant. The empire was divided into provinces, and each province had a governor. So it wasn't just a bunch of people roaming in, in the streets and, and building huts and things. Again, the, these images that have been used to portray people who live in inner Africa. By the way, we don't use the term sub-Saharan African. You probably heard that term. But let me tell you why we don't use that term because it's a term that was created by Europeans to suggest that there was an impervious wall between the northern people who lived in Africa, such as the, the, the Libyans, the Moroccans, and the Egyptians, and the people who lived on the other side of the Sahara Desert who were savages, who were unrefined. But the reality is, as, and we'll get into this more as we study the different kingdoms of Africa, that the people who lived in Egypt were connected and related to the people who lived in Nigeria. And the people who lived in Nigeria were related to the people who lived in Sudan because the story of humanity is one of continuous migration. Anthropologists talk about it and they refer to it in terms of push and pull factors. When the environment became inhospitable for whatever reason, because of war, because of famine, because of drought, People moved. Where did they move? To where the water was, so that they could have water for their cattle, so that they could grow crops. But they brought their languages, they brought their traditions with them wherever they went. So this thought that the people in quote unquote sub-Saharan Africa have no connection, no relations to the people who live in North Africa is a European fabrication. The reality is that all human beings started in the southeast part of Africa in what is called the Great Rift Valley, which, by the way, I had a wonderful opportunity to visit most recently. I recommend that for everyone. But now let's finish this conversation about Mali. Mali is one great African empire, and it lasted for 440 years. Now, what's significant about that number is this, that if you look at all of the empires, whether it be Asian empires, European empires, uh, empires that exist in North America, what you see is the average life of an empire is between 300 and 350 years. So it's quite remarkable then that this mighty African empire lasted for roughly 440 years. And we talked about empires in the past uh, in ancient Africa uh, in antiquity, such as uh, Kemet, which lasted for 3,000 years, and Kush, which lasted for 2,700 years. What the Africans did, they did it right. They put in the infrastructure, and it lasted a very long time. So we celebrate Mali. But why did Mali come to an end? Well, Mali came to an end for the same reason that every other empire came to an end, infighting among siblings. After one king dies who has five or six or seven or eight sons, Who's going to be the king? So, I mean, I think the thing that we should know about Africa is, in one sense, it's extraordinary, but in another sense, it's ordinary, just like all other human beings. Uh, power corrupts, absolutely, and absolute power corrupts. And so there was issues of fighting, right? And whenever we are fighting, whoever we are, whatever empire, whatever nation we are, whenever there's infighting, that creates an opportunity for our opponents, for our enemies from the outside to exploit our weakness, to exploit the fact that we are not paying attention. And that is what happened. And that is what brought Mali to an end. Now, that's an oversimplification, but at the end of the day, that's what happened. But it was a great empire, and it did make a significant contribution to learning in its day. It was a place of learning. It was a place of cultural development and awareness. It was a place of trade. It was a world-class empire.